Uh, welcome back uh, to the third day of the College of Surgeons from Surgical Congress. And uh, you are joining us with, after the tea break. And the next symposium is on regional surgeons. And this will be chaired by Dr. SSM Nias. He's a consultant surgeon currently working at National Hospital Candy. And he will be co chaired by uh, Dr. Rohan Sirisena. He's a consultant surgeon currently working at the Good morning, everybody. It is the seventh symposium of the 49th Sri Lankan Surgical Congress 2020. And uh, we are very happy that so far the program is going extremely well. And uh, next symposia is Regional Surgeons Symposium. And uh, this time we have surgeons from Central Province southern chapter and eastern province and uh, northern province and uh, to start the progress program and uh, let me introduce dr bandula samarasinghe from the central uh, chapter bandula is a senior lecturer in surgery university of peradeniya and is a consultant surgeon who is uh, attached to teaching hospital and his special interest is in vascular surgery and renal transplant. Over to Bandula Samaras. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Pediatric renal transplant, the inception and the journey. My talk is based on renal transplant program run by professorial surgical and pediatric units of teaching hospital Peradeniya. I would like to share our experience in not only transplant surgery, but also in dialysis success surgery for children with renal failure. End stage renal disease. Once these children in, with renal disease reach end stage, they need either dialysis or transplant. What is best for these children? Is it dialysis or is it transplantation? With modern dialysis techniques, a ch child of almost any size can be supported but it is extremely difficult to maintain a normal homeostatic environment. Therefore, it is associated with major problems, including bone disease, growth failure, anemia, serious infections, cardiovascular morbidity, access issues for hemodialysis, membrane failure for peritoneal dialysis, psychological challenges, and overall increased mortality. The first successful pediatric kidney transplant was performed at the University of Minnesota in 1963. However, early transplants were complicated by technical, immunologic, and logistical problems that lead to low rates of graft and Persian survival. But with time, the advances in surgical techniques, immunosuppression, and management of infections in children have contributed to the favorable outcome that we see today. The transplant program at Peradeniya was initiated by Professor M.D. Lama Wansa and others in 2004. We had a very good foundation to establish the program and that enabled us to sustain and develop it. The pediatric unit in teaching hospital Peradeniya was a referral center for renal disease. We had surgeons who had experience in pediatric surgery and vascular surgery. Dr. Oswald Fernando, an eminent transplant surgeon from UK, was at hand as an external expert. The anesthesia department was ready to take the challenge of anesthetizing and looking after these children postoperatively. The radiology and pathology departments were ready to help. So was the already established adult transplant program at Candy. We had number of challenges in early days. There were issues with social backgrounds and finances of the children and the donors. The infrastructure was sufficient but was limited. The dialysis was primitive. The patients were often anemic, undernourished. There were anesthetic issues like cardiomyopathy, ascites, deranged liver functions, bleeding tendency. Monitoring of drug levels were difficult, but we managed to address these issues and overcome them with time. 
These are the members of the team who initiated the transplant program. So far, we have performed 131 transplants in 129 patients. These are the indications for transplant in our patient population. In younger children, it was mainly congenital defects, while in older children, it was mainly glomerulonephritis. We had two patients with Alport syndrome, the brother and the sister of the same family from Japan. This is the graphic presentation of number of transplants we did in each year. On average, we do more than eight transplants per year. However, the number of number varies depending on the number of fully prepared patients, that is with donors. We manage to perform the operation within one to two weeks once the patient is ready. Therefore, we don't have a waiting list for transplants. This is the geographical distribution of our patients. We have catered almost all the regions of the island. The youngest to transplant was one year and nine months. The average of a patient is 11 years and five months. Most of our children were males. There were 84 males as opposed to 45 females. The site of implantation depends on the recipient's weight. Generally, when weight is less than 20 kilos, it is intraperitoneal. And when it is more than 20 kilos, it is extraperitoneal. However, we prefer extraperitoneal implantation and we manage to do that successfully in 129 times. The site of arterial anastomosis depends on the patient's weight and size. When it was less than 16 kilos, the aorta was chosen. And for the rest, the common iliac artery was selected. The venous anastomosis was done to one of the IVC, common iliac vein or external iliac vein. We use extraperitoneal urethroneocystostomy or leach trigger technique for ureteric implantation. Our use of ureteric stents were very selective. In fact, we used only 10 stents in our series, but our ureteric complications are not significant with other data available in literature. Once these children are stable, they, they are handed over to regional nephrologists for follow-up. Currently, 92 children with functioning transplants are being followed up at nephrology clinic Peradeni. Some of the transplanted children have done well in their education and life. Five children have entered into state universities, while one child has entered to a private university. Fourteen of them are employed at the moment. These are the surgical complications we have come across so far. Most common complication was bleeding or oozing and period, uh, perinephric hematoma which required reopening. Out of nine surgical site infections, only one was significant. Unfortunately, that ended up with graft loss. There were three lymphocytes, and one required mass realization while others were aspirated. Two patients developed acute limb ischemia and managed with fem fem crossover bypasses. We had 21 deaths in our series. The causes of sepsis, intracranial hemorrhages, myocardial infarctions, bleeding, and CA. At Peradenia, we have done 131 donor nephrectomies. All of them were live donors. The technique was open surgery, except two hand assisted laparoscopic surgeries. We haven't done any cadaveric transplants for children. Most of our donors were related to the patient. The relationship is shown in the chart. Although most of our recipients were males, in contrast, most of our donors were females. Fortunately, we didn't have significant donor complications. There were five incidences of sleep clamps. 
out of them two donors went into shock but they had a full recovery regarding renal access surgeries we have performed six arteriovenous fistulae all of them were brachiocephalic fistulae our role in rhine related issues were to help in arresting of bleeding and in open insertion of cup central lines For peritoneal dialysis, we insert both temporary and permanent lines. We use laparoscope for the insertion of permanent line. As a team, we meet regularly for workup, pre-op multidisciplinary team meetings, and morbidity and mortality meetings if required. This has helped to achieve a better outcome. And this is our current transplant team. Today we are equipped with all necessary surgical instruments. We have two operating rooms to operate both the donor and the recipient simultaneously. Therefore, the cold ischemia time is minimal. There are dedicated spaces in ICU and nephrology ward to look after these children post-operatively. At the beginning, cold heart mask solution was used for perfusion. Since 2015, custodial solution is used instead. We had a small function to celebrate the 100th transplant in 2018. In this picture, successful recipients are posing for a photograph with Dr. Oswald Fernando. Our next aim is to perform donor nephrectomies laparoscopically. For that, the necessary equipments are available at Peradini, and the surgeons have the required training. It may be possible to achieve that target during 2020 itself unless hampered by the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Bandula. It was very enlightening. And uh, I'm sure you would be very happy to note uh, your co-assistant, Rohan Sirisena, is with me. And Rohan was telling me that uh, you both were the first to be the assistant of Professor Lamarans. That was very interesting. And was Rohan, who assist for uh, the patient called Minhaj. <laughs> Very nice. We'll keep the questions uh, uh, at the end. Okay, and, uh, uh, shall I ask Rohan Sirisena to introduce the next speaker? Rohan, over to you. Thank you. So, next speaker is Dr. Hemant Sudhasinghe. He's a consultant surgeon attached to the District General Hospital, Hamantuta. He has special interest in thyroid surgery and laparoscopic surgery. Today, he is going to talk on advanced laparoscopic experience in a peripheral center. What to do, uh, Dr. Susan? Uh, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction, Rohan. Uh, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, very good morning yeah, to everybody. Very well. We can yeah. hear you very well. Okay, yeah, thank you. Very good morning to those uh, audience who joined with us today online. And uh, this is the first time the Surgical Congress of Sri Lanka is held online due to the prevailing COVID situation. And I hope this will be the last as well. And no, we, we think, we think uh, Hemanta, you should go on. If it's necessary, we can access everybody <laughs> all over the world. So why not? <laughs> okay, I will proceed with my presentation in my experience in uh, uh, advanced laparoscopic surgeon, uh, surgery as a surgeon in a peripheral hospital. Our main training in uh, advanced laparoscopic surgery, usually we get when we do our overseas training. Uh, at least those who have done the overseas training before 2030, uh, we should get the uh, great exposure in doing advanced procedures like uh, colectomies, uh, uh, anterior sections, splenectomies, nephrectomies uh, uh, during our overseas training. And also, we get to learn uh, more of uh, laparoscopic, advanced laparoscopic procedures through laparoscopic workshops held by various professional bodies like uh, College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, Amazon India, and also we can do some self-learning. Uh, what I mean by self-learning is uh, if you are not having the enough instruments, uh, enough expertise, you can do uh, partial mobilizations, partial dissections, then open up and see what you have done. Then uh, with the next patient, you can proceed further. That's way of uh, learning advanced procedures uh, bit by bit. And what is the importance of laparoscopy? Uh, 
there are an ever increasing number of laparoscopic procedures almost all the general surgical uh, open surgeries have now uh, laparoscopic counterparts and also inarguably there are uh, better outcomes in laparoscopic surgery in terms of uh, short hospital stay better cosmesis better pain relief and also in oncological procedures now the laparoscopic procedures have become uh, sometimes equivalent sometimes superior to the open counterparts also patients tend to demand now the when they hear from their neighbors friends that they have been subjected to laparoscopic surgery and they don't have a scar especially uh, the patients demand when they face uh, surgical procedures whether uh, they can be they can also undergo laparoscopic procedure and there are certain requirements to advance laparoscopic procedures you need a good system better if you have a hd system high definition system and you need uh, certain instruments uh, more than the basic uh, requirements you need to go energy source electrical or ultrasonic and you need ports we have 5 mm 10 mm ports everywhere but you at least need the 113 mm port when you do laparoscopic surgery and also if you have stapler devices uh, that's also a requirement and uh, important most important thing you need to have a good support your team uh, you need to train the minor staff the nurses and the the medical shos to support you uh, during the laparoscopic procedures uh, this is my current place of work this district general hospital of ambantota which was Uh, funded by soft loan from Netherlands and came as a fully furnished and equipped hospital. And with these equipments, we received another good laparoscopic system, a cast off system. This picture of it, another closer look at it. And this is an old system, Olympa system. We still use this. And this is our energy source. We had this uh, before the new hospital was commissioned. And the sonar surge, the sonic dissector as well. and i must mention that i have worked uh, since i returned from my overseas training from 2014 uh, to 2019 i have worked in several uh, peripheral hospitals including base hospital balapitiya madirigiriya then mathura and uh, monaragala and uh, most uh, all of these hospitals didn't have all the requirements to advance laparoscopic surgery Uh, either they didn't have a good system or they didn't have a energy source or uh, they didn't have uh, proper instruments but i am very happy to say that uh, when i came to district general hospital hambantota we had all the equipment necessary to do laparoscopic advanced laparoscopic procedures this is thanks to these two gentlemen dr rajendra besekar who is my co surgeon now and dr priyanta sinarachi who was my predecessor uh, they have uh, Uh, done tremendous work to establish uh, the system required for advanced laparoscopic surgery and they have done many procedures even before i came to this general, general hospital hambantota but here we faced another problem this is in terms of medical officers this is one of the slides we uh, presented to uh, uh, director general of health services you can see the bottom three ampar monragal hambantota similar number of, of uh, consultants but very few number of uh, medical officers so it is very difficult to function even the basic uh, we can't even provide the basic services uh, needed by a district general hospital because of this the lack of these medical officers that's one of the challenges faced by uh, surgeons who work in the periphery uh, we have approached Uh, director general of health services and also the trade unions and hope that they will rectify this error uh, very soon and even if you have enough card enough medical officers when you do advanced laparoscopic surgery sometimes the medical officers are not very keen to uh, help you uh, because these procedures take very long hours 4 5 6 hours sometimes and uh, even when they are keen they may not have enough uh, expertise to follow the procedure hold the camera away and assist you in certain instances and even when you train a good uh, medical officer for about 1 uh, to 2 years then suddenly they leave on annual transfers then you are back to square one again 
So uh, what we have done to overcome this issue is uh, we work in pairs. Whenever I do a procedure, Dr. Rajendra Baisekar comes and helps me. And for his procedures, I go and help him throughout the procedure. So for the last 18 months, we have done seven esophagectomies, four anterior resections, five abdominal perineal resections, four right hemicolectomies, and one free of chromocytomaxism, all as complete laparoscopic procedures. So my advice to those surgeons who are uh, struggling to do the advanced laparoscopic surgeries, I know they have got the uh, required training, but they struggle because lack of medical officers, lack of instruments. So instruments you can get one by one if you channel the uh, proper uh, uh, areas, you can find the necessary funds. And uh, for medical officers, best option is to uh, work with your co-surgeon if you are in a two-man station or get your uh, surgeon in your closest hospital because they will always help you and th that is a win-win situation for both of you because you can increase the uh, scale level of your uh, advanced laparoscopic surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Hemanta, for your excellent presentation. It's nice to remind uh, Dr. Priyanka Sinarachi. He also did a yes. lot of work at uh, yes. the District General Hospital. Yes. And I'm sure you are doing a very good job at uh, Ambanthad Hospital. And uh, so we'll discuss the questions at the end of the session. Okay. Yes, hey, Martha. You know, um, not only you have all the fantastic, uh, good looking, and well equipped hospital, you yes. have a very good highway too, which uh, the central province lacks. I hope you know, <laughs> that will come. And uh, <laughs> also regarding uh, Dr. Rajendra Obeysekar and Priyanta Sinarachi, on behalf of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, I congratulate them for to have done a marvelous job. This should be taken as an example uh, by every surgeon and, you know, every, uh, I would say, every surgeons in the country to develop like this, you know, how much appreciative you are and we are about uh, all of your work. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Rajendra Pesekra and Priyanta Sinarachi and uh, congratulations to him on the uh, superb work. And uh, shall we go on to the next uh, speaker? And uh, thank you, Hemanta. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker is uh, from Northern Chapter. And he is none other than Dr. Srikanth and Gobi Krishna. Gobi Shankar. Uh, Gobi Shankar, sorry, I mispronounced. Sorry, Gobi Shankar. Uh, Srikanth and Gobi Shankar. And he's going to talk about esophageal cancer in northern Sri Lanka. Is it a different entity? And he is the senior lecturer in the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya. And he's a one of the University of Jaffna. I'm sorry, Gobi Shankar, I'm mispronouncing no. everything. <laughs> And uh, he's an honorary consultant in teaching hospital, Jaffna. And uh, we all know that you have a special interest in hepatobiliary and laparoscopic surgery. And uh, very keen to listen to your lecture. We are waiting for it. And over to you, Gopi Shankar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me as a speaker in this uh, session. And uh, I would like to start my so esophageal cancer in northern Sri Lanka, it's a different entity. So I am not going anything differently, but I am just justifying my topic with the studies which has done already. So as an introduction, if you, if you, took, uh, if you take the uh, overall incidence in esophageal cancer in Sri Lanka, this is a fourth common cancer. And in males or females, and the overall it's a fourth common cancer in females, First is a breast, we all know, and uterine cervix cancer and thyroid cancer are the first three places, and this is the third, fourth one. And in males, uh, other than the oropharyngeal cancers and the lung cancer, this is a third common cancer. And in the world, it's the eighth most common cancer. So we can see this is very important for the Asian and Sri Lankan population. And if you look at the incidence uh, in the worldwide incident, is 5.9 at the moment. And then Asia 7.7, .7, the China is 12.5. I'm mentioning the China because this is a country where we can see the uh, high incidence rate. So this is a very crowded slide, but I'm uh, thinking uh, the people who are looking in front of the 
personal computer or laptop can see the uh, incidence of uh, Asian countries, especially Sri Lanka is in the higher place, which is 5.6, especially in South Asian countries. Uh, maybe we are the top most other than the Bhutan. So everybody can uh, uh, see this 5.6 figure there. And in Sri Lanka, as I told you, the incidence rate is 5.6. In that square muscle carcinoma is 70.5 percentage majority and adenocarcinoma is around 7.8 percentage. And if you take the male-female ratio, again, the square muscle carcinoma is common in female and adenocarcinoma is common in male with 4.1 is to 1 ratio. So this uh, study was done by uh, Vikram Singh and Samara Sagar in 19, 2016. Uh, they, they compared the ethnicity and the incidence of malignancy, which I took for my uh, bro, my topic. The esophageal cancer and the total population percentage was more or less equal in single age population. You can see that 82 percentage of the population comprising 79.5 percentage of the incidents in esophageal cancer and in Muslim again 7.9 percentage of the population causing around 3 percentage of incidents that is around 4 percentage, 0.4 percentage but if you look at the Tamil population they are contributing 9.4 percentage in the population and 16.8 percentage in esophageal cancer incidents so it's almost 1.8 percentage that is just less than the double. So if you look at the epidemiology in Northern province, uh, compared with the international and national data, 5.9 in international and 5.6 in Sri Lanka, we are in 8.3 to 8.708. But this data was taken from Trial Cancer Institute, uh, Telepala. So this hospital is the only hospital where we can send the patient for chemotherapy or radiotherapy. The people, who did not go to this hospital or did not get the treatment uh, to this hospital, the data will not be included. That is first. And patients sometimes may move into the other part of Sri Lanka, especially Colombo. That also did not include it in this data. So I believe this 8.3 or something is lesser than the actual data. So if you look at the etiological factors, some of these factors are proven in Sri Lanka and others are proven by the national and international data, old age, male, race, we all know these are special and common factors, but it's very uh, minimally important. Cigarette smoking and alcohol, we always talking about any cancer, we're talking about cigarette smoking and alcohol, but I'm highlighting this tobacco and beetle chewing and arachnid chewing because a uh, lot of studies coming from Sri Lanka and Asian countries shows this is a common thing for Asian population for Square muscle carcinoma. And uh, dietary and uh, nutritional factor also common uh, and uh, minimal uh, involvement in the esophageal cancer and other traditional factors, stylosis, achalasia, and plumber Vincent syndrome and genetics are contributing for the esophageal cancer etiology. Uh, These three important factors, it was studied earlier, but nowadays, uh, important of this. Each of the factors are coming up because Asian countries uh, are more prone to have these factors, especially chilies and spicy food in their meals is one. Consuming drinking water, uh, drinks and water or food with high temperature. The American Cancer Society guideline says if we are taking the uh, food temperature more than 65 can contribute to the esophageal or oropharyngeal cancer. And the, especially the third one I am very interested in is the drinking water source contaminated with or uh, containing nitrates level more than the. So uh, I just for the sake uh, uh, giving the data of the incident, uh, the risk factors for the adenocarcinoma, which is uh, uh, tobacco and alcohol are similar to the squamous cell carcinoma, but the main factor we consider here is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and the barrel cheese of acres. And these are the main contributing factors for adenocarcinoma worldwide and other than that gender, race, and obesity, again, nutritional deficiencies, drugs, still it is in the debate, but uh, statin, they believe sometimes it can cause a minimal risk with less physical activity and genetic factors. 
So this study was done by Vikram Singh and Samara Sagar. Uh, they have come to a conclusion that lifestyle and the environmental factors are greater important than the inheritance from uh, genetically. And use of so, uh, smokeless tobacco, that tobacco, tobacco chewing is higher in Sri Lankan population than developed countries. And therefore, they can come to a conclusion. It could be the, one of the major risk factors for esophageal squamous cell carcinoma in Sri Lanka. Finally, they mentioned that channel ethnicity have high incidence of uh, risk of developing esophageal cancer. I'll come to the point later that whether this is uh, the people coming from India or the Tamil people uh, contributing this factor uh, at the later part of my talk. And uh, what is the relationship between the drinking water and nitrate level? Why we are concentrating this is the WHO guideline says uh, if the drinking water contains nitrate levels more than 10 milligrams, that is unsafe for drinking. That is a very important point. And this is in 1988 proved that uh, this nitrate can be converted to a carcinogenic substance in our body as a nitrosamine, and that can cause esophageal cancer and stomach cancers. Then uh, Gunasagram in 1983 have done a study on groundwater in Jaffna Peninsula and he proved that most of the drinking water in wells are exceeded the WHO limits. This is 1983. And Panbuk in 1984 has done a study on malignant tumors in Sri Lanka. Data was collected from 1973 to 1977 and he has confirmed that the occurrence of cancer is relatively high in Jaffna district than the other district in Sri Lanka. That is one point. And one of the reasons for the esophageal cancer could be high level of nitrate in level in groundwater. That is her conclusion in 1984. Then in 2003, Sivaraja reported that high nitrate content in water could be associated with a high incidence of cancer in the gastrointestinal tract in the Jaffna people. Other study done by Mihundan and B. Silva in 2008. His study in, done in 83 wells in Jaffna district and showed that more than 72 percentage of the well water was above the WH recommended level of nitrates. And Gunalan and his team done a study in 2011. In the study they have done in Chunagam area, which was um, done in Chunagam drinking water area high risk of cancer in that people living in Chunagam because of consumption of well water, which has high concentration of uh, nitrate and level, recommended level, higher level than the recommended level by the WHO. Finally, the Sudarshini and her team done a study in 2014. Uh, they have found a 38 percentage of farm well water, which contain more than the recommended level of nitrates level. That is not suitable for drinking, but all these studies, uh, the publics don't know and still they are drinking, most of the people are drinking this water and we don't know the actual nitrate level at the moment. And a uh, very a nice article I have got, uh, this is a 1977 publication, but uh, I don't know how many of you can see the bibliography which was taken 18, 19 centuries. I'll read the conclusion. The inhabitants of Ceylon have been chewing beetle for centuries. There is naturally a great variety of other stimulants such as alcohol, narcotics and etc. But beetle is undoubtedly the most common substance being used by majority of the population and on all the possible occasions. I, I would like to highlight this sentence being used by majority of the population and on all possible occasions still this statement is acceptable for the northern province. Apparently there are no negative side effects resulting from the usage of the than perhaps from the standpoint of western aesthetics. Beetle is not addictive and thus not containing any destructive qualities. It is however socially habit forming like example of tea in Afghanistan and coffee in Arabian and in the third para, they have mentioned uh, risk involved in the constant mechanical irritation in the oral cavity and pharynx 
caused by chewing of lime and other ingredients or other additional ingredients in this beetle chewing. So we don't know this uh, beetle chewing is happening for centuries and centuries. So whether it could be the reason for high incidence of esophageal cancer in Northern province, uh, we can't believe. In addition, uh, re very recently, the study is ongoing study done in Telepera Trial Cancer Hospital. Breath P V600 E mutation, which is usually found in the melanoma, lung cancers, non simulated lung cancers, and possibly in esophageal cancer as well. This cancer can be transmitted uh, genetically from parents, or it could be occurred from the environmental factors. Uh, they have found that 92.5 percentage of the esophageal cancer patients shows this mutation. Uh, especially, uh, they have found that this mutation is not related to etiological factor, whether they have uh, smoking or alcohol etiological factors or not. This uh, gene mutation is positive in 92.5 percentage. Uh, only this is an ongoing study and only 40 patients are included in this study at the moment. Uh, so we still need some more data to come to a conclusion. So as a conclusion, I would like to tell Northern Province show the high incidence of esophageal cancer in Sri Lanka. There's no other word. But we don't know it could be due to high nitrates level in drinking water or chewing of methyl tobacco arachnid, as told by some of the studies or it could be a genetic factor in Tamil population. There should be a study in these etiological factors until that the etiological factor for the esophageal cancer in Northern province is like an iceberg. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, God Krishna. That's a very enlightening, thought-provoking presentation, I would say. And a lot of questions uh, arises uh, from your... That's very versed and well transmitted. It was very clear, extremely clear, though you are a little far away from us at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice. And uh, so we have some uh, time for questions. And to start with, uh, uh, Babi Shankar, can I ask uh, you this question? There is a question yeah. from the audience. And yeah. uh, have you, do you have any comparison study with the uh, estate population in the central province? Because uh, being working in the central province, me and myself, we see quite a lot of uh, uh, surgical malignancies uh, in the uh, estate population. And uh, do you have any uh, study on that? And uh, the night yes, uh, this, uh, I, I, Yeah, I would like to highlight this study done by Vikram Singh and Samara Sagar, they have uh, included, uh, they have uh, identified some studies uh, from India and internationally. Uh, they, they have proven that uh, the Tamil population in India did not have this kind of uh, uh, incidents there. That is one point. And right. second point, the people migrated from India, not Sri Lanka, but various other part of the uh, um, world. They have uh, did not show any any this kind of uh, increased incidence though they have proven it is not due to the people from india hmm. it is specifically for tamil population in sri lanka right and uh, any study on the estate population the nitrate content in the water no, especially this nitrate contents also there are some studies i did not include because of time the mainly the uh, the, the non proper usage of uh, agriculture the chemical agriculture fertilizer. That is the main reason. There's no regulation. There's no mm, monitoring for everything. Uh, and the, the well and the people living areas are very nearby near the, because it is very crowded, a very small place. Jaffna Peninsula is a very small place and the water is very shallow water. If you dig the ground very quickly, you can find the water. So easily it can contaminate it within the shallow groundwater. So that is the reason they have found uh, more contaminated nitrogen in level, nitrate in levels in the Afghan Peninsula and Northern part. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. So Dr. Bandula Samarsinghe, Bandula, we have a few questions for you. And uh, regarding uh, JJ stents, and uh, so you had uh, seven leagues uh, in your series. 
And uh, do you think that uh, JJ stent can prevent the leak in uh, renal transplant? Um, uh, yes, in a way it might prevent, but uh, the experience with JJ stents are they are associated with infections. So uh, in these children, they are they have multiple comorbidities. On top of that, if they develop an UTI, that might complicate the outcome. So we prefer not to use that. Yeah, actually at Javadanapura, we always use uh, JJ stents as a routine procedure. Within two weeks or two to three weeks, we pull the stent out. Uh, we do flexible cystoscopy and we pull it out. Up to now, we didn't have uh, problems with uh, JJ stents. And uh, I just went through the researchers also. Some people say it is advantageous and some people don't say it. So you, routinely, you don't use that. We don't use routinely, yeah. unless we are worried about the vascular edge of the ureter and difficult dissection around bladder. And one more question, and the disease donor program, what's the hindrance actually? You haven't done any uh, disease donor uh, renal transplant. The thing is, uh, we have, uh, in Sri Lanka, we don't have a proper disease donor program. And for children, if we are doing a uh, disease donor kidney, we need to have a best kidney because their life expectancy is more than the adults. So uh, uh, since we don't have a well-established uh, disease donor program, we haven't thought about that. We might do it in future. Bhagda, can I ask you one more thing? You know, uh, is it always common idea cartilage that you, you all used or were there no, instances sir. where you have to use uh, the aorta? No, sir. Most of the time we have used aorta. Aorta. In uh, our practice, we have seen if we do the anastomosis to the aorta, outcome is better. Right. The function will come early. Right. Thank you. We have one question for Hemanta. Hemanta, are you with us? Yes, sir. Uh, Hemanta, you spoke about very emotionally about the medical officers and I hope with the Ministry of Health and uh, College of Surgeons president is just beside me. You can't see him. Yeah. He will take some action about that. And uh, how about the trainees? PJ trainees coming to Hambanda? I'm sure they will love it. Uh, yes, we, we have not uh, pro uh, produced data yet. We are planning to uh, submit data and get some uh, PG trainees because we do a lot of uh, work here in Ambanta. All right. You know, would you please send you an um, uh, audit yeah. and uh, I'll promise you, I also will take it up uh, with the board of study and, you know, get you yes. some registrars. I am sure they should be. Yes, and uh, yeah, with that note, we had a lovely regional forum and uh, I hope this regional forum, these you know, sessions will connect all the surgeons, though this is a small country, Traveling at from places are sometimes difficult, and uh, so this regional forum will continue. And uh, this uh, successful session, I am sure, gives a good input and enthusiasm and insight into this program. And uh, next year, next year, President is just walking into the uh, room, and I am sure he will take it up uh, with the regional forums as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. Sir.